Did you at least bring my clothes? Shirt, socks, everything you need. You didn't bring my pants. Who am I, Tommy Bahama? Oh, this is the worst day of my life. It's the worst day of your life so far. A Goofy movie is a story about Goofy, and it is a movie. Nah, 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 it's like, nah, it's like, nah. I don't know, I usually try not to do these videos on things that I feel like other people have done better than I ever could. It just kind of feel like I'm repeating a bunch of points that someone else made. Like, I'm never doing Static Shock. I'm never doing BoJack or Gravity Falls or Rocket Power or Doug. Nobody, nobody did those better than I ever could. I just really fucking hate Rocket Power and Doug. You can send all of your hate mail to my new Twitter account. I actually go by a new alias. It's at 254 man. No, but a Goofy movie is kind of a special case. Because while I feel like there's been a lot of conversation about it, seriously, like, all you gotta do is type it in, I don't think a lot of my thoughts on the film have been said. I don't want to talk about how brilliant its musical construction is, or how it's pretty much the only Disney movie structured like an actual film, or whatever the hell Doug Walker did. Oh yeah, this scene. This scene makes me cry! But I want to pat it on the back a little for what it achieves with its storytelling. It does a few things better than any other Disney movie that I think go a little overlooked. Right, D'Angelo from Hats Off Media? Gee, Velma from Scooby-Doo sure is hot. You're broken. <laughs> Watch the breakdown. Oh my god, can you stop with these long pretentious openings? Just get on with the video, I wanna go home. Bitch! I'm I just saying, all you take for fucking ever to upload a video anyways. Stupid ass jokes in the opening just the audio think that y'all can talk so to me any kind of way like I won't smack this shit out your father. I work 35 hours a week and I come home just to see a bunch of goofy ass niggas make fun of the fucking font that I use. Today's video is brought to you by Skillshare. You yelling for no reason, it ain't even that deep. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different classes covering dozens of different creative topics, all taught by well-versed professionals. Premium membership gives you unlimited access, so you can join whatever classes or communities you feel like are right for you. Whether you want to feel your curiosity, creativity, or even your career, Skillshare is honestly the best place for you to go to continue to develop whatever your craft is. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself, and introduce you to a community of millions. There's classes on poster design, animation, writing, but if you're in art, I'd recommend... Hi, I'm Carlo Casar. Exploring color in your illustrations using a limited color palette. It teaches a really important skill that I wish I learned a long time ago. As you can clearly see, I have given up on color. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. We're a little short. Hell. But the first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership, so you can explore your creativity without having to put the bag up. It's curated specifically for learning, so there's like no ads or anything like that. And they're always launching new premium classes, so you can just stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. At a time when there's just so many important conversations happening in our world, your voice is more essential than I think you realize. Explore some classes to unlock your creativity for social good. Just go to Skillshare.com slash Toonrific Tariq 7. Skillshare.com slash T-O-O-N-R-I-F-I-C-T-A-R-I-Q 7 for two months completely free. I don't know, man. I think I might just... Do the streets want a goofy movie? You have my attention. We want Daria. Not yet. What the fuck? In fact, the streets need both movies. So, are you doing the sequel too, or... Both movies, or just the first? Shit, I will always love to see more goofy and extremely goofy movie coverage. It's me, Prim, by the way. I'm reading this. I didn't write it though, but I agree. Sure, but the streets need an extremely goofy movie. If you touch on the sequel, everyone will like it. If you touch on the sequel, then everyone will like it. I had... I had two people record this one by accident. Goofy movie and extremely goofy movie, please? No. I honestly haven't been able to look at the second one the same way after Jeff Trammell told me that it has the exact same plot as the Parkers. But fine, since y'all want it, I'll talk about it. God damn. But I'm only giving it 60 seconds.
extremely goofy movie is a movie about goofy wanting to get a better job and be closer to his son so he starts to go to his son's college and falls in love with an employee the parkers is a series about nikki parker wanting to get a better job and be closer to her daughter so she starts to go to her daughter's college and falls in love with an employee now that that's out of the way an extremely goofy movie is actually really fun admittedly it isn't the one that i go back to often but it's still full of great animation sweet moments and legitimate character growth <laughs> or i love you I hear people talk about not liking the extreme sports side of things, but the way I see it, the original is like relentlessly 90s, so I don't see what's so bad about the sequel being grossly 2000s. The romance between Goofy and the librarian is really sweet and sincere, and Max, while not given as much to do, still has a lot of really interesting and understandable character motivations. And Goofy, well, it makes sense. The overbearing nature wouldn't just be knocked out of him after the first movie. It's a part of who he is. This is a new situation for both of them, so it makes sense that he wouldn't exactly know his boundaries yet. And also, this movie has one of my favorite last lines of dialogue ever. He is so goofy. Son, I can't even thank Jims anymore. I'm just like blatantly stealing from him at this point. Alright, so if that's not enough, I'll just let my homeboy awkwardly animated talk about it. Oh, thanks, man. Happy to be here. I don't, I, what are you, I, who are you dressed as? Halloween was like two weeks ago. Look, I... Why do you always script all your stutters? What's up with that? Listen, y'all. An extremely goofy movie is severely slept on. It has a lot of crazy good moments that do get overlooked, and I get why people aren't as fond of it as they were the original, but let me remind you all how good this movie is. What I have noticed is that the main argument people have is that the movie isn't as timeless and leans too heavily on trendy things like extreme sports and early 2000s slang. I'll admit it, those critiques are valid, the movie is way too distanced from the original and it doesn't really carry over anything from the first film, which does make it a lot easier to hop into I guess, but like, come on, the lack of Roxanne in this one was a bad movie. I've heard some people try and twist it and say they liked it because it shows that, you know, relationships don't last forever, people move on, college pushes people away, but like, what? No, that was not even hinted at in this movie, but hey, it's okay, the movie isn't short on baddies, you got that one girl, you know the one, yeah, that's her. My G, she doesn't even have a name, the credits legit just list her as Beret Girl. Just, let me have this, okay? The movie has a lot of that slice of life stuff that sounds boring on paper, but is so much more enjoyable to watch because it's the characters you love doing it. If you really think about it, it's kind of impressive that none of this comes across as jarring or out of place when these characters were never really meant to be this serious. Okay, I guess I should talk about the main crux of the movie, which is the whole X Games plot that goes on. Here is where the movie starts to show its flaws as we get the inevitable divide between Max and his dad and we've seen it done better in the first movie so I don't quite understand why do it again here. The way Max is acting in those final scenes is really irrational and honestly a lot of these problems could be solved if they just simply talk to each other. Aside from that, Goofy really is the highlight here. He gets a ton of great moments and scenes that really steal the show. I really love the cute relationship he gets with Sylvia and how they bond over the most obscurest of nerd stuff. and. Oh my god, you can't tell me the dance scene at the club isn't goaded. I do want to talk about Brad for a sec since he does play a decent role in the movie. He's not all that great as far as antagonists go, but I didn't mind him most of the time. He's exactly what you'd expect from that douche frat boy, except he's extremely over the top in a way that actually makes him enjoyable on screen. You just don't really take him seriously as a villain with all the goofy and wacky facial expressions he's making, which is a good thing in my eyes. I feel like he would be unbearable if he was serious all the time. All right, look, I'm just gonna go out and say it. I love this movie. It just hits all the right beats for me personally. It still has the heart of the first one while also trying some new things here and there. And while most of it isn't as great as the first movie, it still has a lot of fun to it. And I'll be honest, it may not be the instant classic that the first one is, but I can say without a doubt that it still manages to stand out above the crowd. Come on, my nigga, what the fuck? You're gross. <laughs> well, that's my time, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm just gonna head out now before I'm not allowed on another Tariq video. Make sure to subscribe. I'll see you guys later. Bye. To stand out above the crowd, even if you got the shout out loud.
No matter what the look, it's Max, I get... Max! Now how's that for an overly drawn out opening? A Goofy Movie is a 1995 film that takes place a few years after the Disney Afternoon series Goof Troop. But we always stick together, Nami. Yeah. Max, now in high school, has a crush on this girl, Roxanne, and really wants to impress her. So, on the last day of school, this nigga dresses up as Prince and lip syncs a song in her honor. She loves it and agrees to go to a party with him to watch a concert on pay-per-view. Fuck. <laughs> son, remember pay-per-view? He's so happy that she agreed to it. Look at this nigga Max, son. He's dressed like me. Look at him. Hey, don't forget to mix your audio, bro. They hate that shit. The principal doesn't really like Max performing all of that jungle music on his stage, so he calls Goofy and puts the grossest amount of fear in his heart. Couldn't be mine. If I were you, Mr. Goof, I'd seriously reevaluate the way you're raising your child before he ends up in the electric chair. So Goofy, because of an earlier conversation with Pete, decides to take Max on a traditional fishing trip. Not only to steer him on the right path, but to fix the relationship. Max lies to Roxanne out of panic and says that his dad's taking him to the concert that they were supposed to watch so he can dance on stage and wave to her on TV. And after that, the movie just kind of becomes about the relationship between Max and Goofy. There's a lot of weight, a lot of air, a lot of complicated emotions, and they're all explored extremely well. And it's all really overt. It hits you right over the head with some of these moments. That scene I played earlier where Goofy reminds Max that they used to say I love you to each other is grossly realistic. Especially if you've ever had a complicated relationship with a parent. Oh, little words like go. Uh, hasta la vista? Like bye bye. Or I pledge allegiance. <laughs> or I love you. Is it, uh, is it soup yet? And something I appreciate is, when Max hands him back the cup and we see that he spelled something with the letters, it doesn't say I love you. He wanted to show that he still cared, but we haven't reached the point in the film yet where they're ready to say that to each other. There's so many like details like this throughout, yet it never feels like it's blatantly shouting at us how these characters feel about one another. So, um, okay, let's see, how do I... Son, I can't believe I'm about to do this shit. Okay. Y'all know who Tupac is, right? Well, don't watch this movie. It's fucking dog shit. I actually saw this twice in theaters on opening day, but that is a totally different story for a totally different video that is also totally not about Tupac. All Eyes on Me has a scene that bothers the shit out of me every single time I see it. It showcases a writing problem that I feel like everybody watching this video can learn from. So boom, peep this scene where Tupac sees his mom for the first time in a while at a cookout. All that dancing tire you out? What you mean tire me out? Still got a couple moves left. <laughs> Shit. I'm just messing with you. This might sound pretty nitpicky, but it plays into a bigger issue in the film. The audience already understands their relationship, and they even share a laugh. So why the hell does fake Tupac say I'm just messing with you? You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. You don't stop that. They do shit like this a lot in this movie, especially in scenes that didn't even happen in real life, like with fake Jada Pickett Smith. Film is visual. If the language of the scene communicates that they're joking, there's no reason to vocalize what we see. Compare it to a scene in a Goofy movie that pretty much does the exact same thing. You really had him fooled, Pete. Me? You jumped out of your skin. Uh oh, I was just pretending for your sake. All right, sure. Did too. Did not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ain't <laughs> it sweet? <laughs> I honestly can't believe that I just worked in all eyes on me on a video about fucking Goof Troop the movie. Just, just checking. This is what y'all subscribe for, right? Is this y'all king like shit? <laughs> I can't nobody tell you nothing, huh? Uh. But really, the point is, a Goofy movie is extremely dense, almost scaringly so. There isn't a single line of dialogue that feels wasted, unnecessary, unwarranted. Everything sounds like something a normal human being would say without being grossly on the nose. It needs to be more about you, like something you're feeling. I'm feeling like everybody watching my motherfucking moves. 
All eyes on me. <laughs> Come on, son. Come on, son. That's not how it... Son! You're fucking... No, this is now a video essay about All Eyes on Me. In this 50-minute video essay, I, will... I think my fascination with this animation has a lot to do with my fascination with the animation on, like, Bebe's kids, right? Not only is it done really well, but it's... Domesticated? Like, it's modern. That's not as normal as you think for 2D animated films of this caliber. It's things we've seen animated before, but just, like, not to this scale. Look at this motel, the diner, their neighborhood, the highway. Even this hallway at the school with the dried out colors used. Don't nobody want to be there, it's perfect. Plus, you can definitely tell different artists did different shots. The touches shine through in the eyes of a detailed animation fan, but is unified enough to where it doesn't become a distraction. I love the depth of field too. The blurred backgrounds, the dolly shots, is all there. And I'll just say it, animation looks so much better when it's shot on film. And not when it's cleaned up 50 years later with gross colors then shoved into the fucking Disney vault. Like when it's in its most raw form. No matter what you try or do on the computer, it'll never look like this again. Just a brief explanation, cartoons used to be drawn, inked, and painted by hand on these cell sheets. When a cell was done, they'd put it under a camera and take a picture of the drawing over the background and repeat. There was no shortcuts, my nigga, it was do or die, ain't no undo button. Baby girl, get that shit out of here. But now it varies on the technique, but ultimately it still all ends up on a computer somehow. With it, you get the HD, the sharp, crystal clear image with poppy colors. But without film, you lose the grit, the dirt, the sweat. These colors will always look better than me projected on a big screen compared to something that just looked like you dipped it in a pile of light brights. It took me five minutes to come up with that metaphor, and I still don't think it's good enough. All right, man. I was thinking we could bring the video to a halt and get your thoughts on the film ah i've been kissed by a bitch nigga get hot water get some disinfectant get some iodine oh, uh. <laughs> so a big thing of note with this movie is it technically defined a generation now that may sound a bit far-fetched, but considering this was more towards my generation, I would think I had the proper mindset to make such a bold statement. Bitch, a goofy movie tackles growing up and wanting to become your own person in a way that I think no other movie really hits right. Max is made to be a typical teenager that many can see themselves in, but he does have that sitcom trope of the goofy dad that you would think breaks relatability, but it actually doesn't. Goofy does act in a manner that annoys anyone in this predicament. Being forced to go on a vacation you didn't want to go on, having to spend time with your family not on your own terms, you easily can get Max's anger towards everything, which makes you get wary comes from in this. He's forced away from his friends and even potential love interests after he pretty much was able to make a big name for himself. Stand out was basically his coming out moment. Okay, not that kind of coming out moment, but actually, maybe it sort of is like that. So what the fuck is you talking about? Okay, just bear with me a little bit. Many of my generation and even Tariq's tend to discover themselves around the time they get to high school usually around freshman or sophomore year. This can include coming out as gay, bi, pan, or so on. Now with Max, we know he's definitely not a senior or even a junior, so we can infer that he's either a freshman or sophomore. In that time, it's very likely he hasn't really made a name for himself to really stand above everybody else. So his moment in the auditorium basically was his big moment to let it be known that this is him and this is how he wants to be seen. This honestly applies to so many teenagers of different creeds and colors, be you LGBT+, Black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, Indian, so on. You tend to want people to see you as you want them to see you. This moment here resonates so easily because it's saying stand above the crowd. Shout it out loud who you are. This is you. It kind of even goes into the idea of this being a positive portrayal of black culture with how it shows teenagers acting towards each other with dap ups in such a casual manner. That's honestly the great power of this movie. It hits in ways that couldn't be appreciated until later. It connects by honestly being a bit more realistic towards what goes on in real life. Life doesn't have big musical numbers with people dancing and singing on cars, you fucking doofus. Yeah, 
I don't play that bullshit here. What I'm trying to say is that there's this nice tinge of reality to the movie that comes in the form of characterization. I mentioned Max and Goofy a bit already, but a big player in the realism is also Roxanne. Typically, especially in 90s shows and movies, girls were portrayed as just the prize, the ones who's only interesting because the guy's interested in her. Maybe you get lucky with a tomboy character, but that's neither here nor there. But Roxanne easily broke that mold. Sure, she's not given a lot of time to her, but the time she is given lets you connect with her and she's characterized damn near perfectly. She's made more like an actual person you may know, an average teenager if you will. She can be awkward, a bit quirky, and even shy. The moment when Max and Roxanne talk in the principal's office is a great scene between them because it gives her characterization. She's just as weird around the guy she likes just as he is around her. She's made into a likable character that we actually want Max to hook up with because we actually like her ourselves. She feels real, basically. And honestly, a big credit to that would have to go to Carol Holiday. She worked with Disney as an animator for a good chunk of the Renaissance era, with one of her biggest claims being her design philosophy of Ariel. She pretty much made the design for Roxanne, giving her that relatable teenager look, and as well as reusing some assets from Disney's properties. Note the hair on Roxanne and Ariel. Roxanne is made to be cute, but not put to a level of unattainable beauty that many characters like her would be. Carol had a strong design philosophy, which ultimately allowed the character to stand the test of time. Sadly, Disney doesn't do much with Roxanne. Then again, they don't do anything much with Max neither, so both kind of got screwed. This movie was able to speak to a generation and still holds up some 20 years later. One of the biggest reasons why this movie is mentioned as a big part of the renaissance era because it has so many layers to it that spoke to so many young people. Oh damn, I really went for a long time. I didn't mean to spit so many bars just for a goofy movie. <laughs> I just love it so much, but anywho, hope I ain't fry your computer, Tariq. Whatever, nigga, your audio was too long. I'm going, I'm going to an ad break now. plot point of the film is that Max alters the map when Goofy makes him the navigator of the trip, meaning that he's leading them to LA instead of Idaho. This causes a lot of tension, a lot of internal conflict. This happens right when Goofy and Max warm up to each other and start to get along. They start to have fun. So when Goofy finds out the truth, it hits you right in the gut every time, I swear to God. Come on, it was really stupid. Changing the map. I, I, I didn't know what it was doing, right? I, I, I was I was panicked. Y'all ever think about Pete's face as he's entering the room here? Pete, you good? Nigga said, ah. People are always putting too much water in these things. The scene where Pete tells Goofy what's going on is frustratingly good. It fucks my head up like a bad barber. Or Dubs Barber. I don't remember what I wrote. I don't have my script in front of me. Bill Farmer gives what is probably the most impressive performance I've ever heard in a Disney movie. Listen to the hurt in his voice. He like shuts down. You almost forget that this is supposed to be goofy. You wouldn't think such a silly voice could give off such a strong emotion. But Jesus Christ, I'm in my bag. I don't believe you. What? I don't believe you, Pete. Well, hey, don't take my word for it. Check your map. I don't need to check the map. I trust my son. And I can't even, I can't get over how well written this exchange right here is. You know, maybe Max isn't all the things that you think a son should be, but he loves me. Hey, my son respects me. Yeah. This ends up leading to the big falling out between the two. The moment all of the distrust and not listening to each other has really boiled up to. A lot of the time, the issue with these kind of movies is that a bunch of these issues usually would be solved if the characters just spoke to each other. But this movie is brilliant because they can't. These two don't have that type of relationship anymore. And even when they try, no one wants to listen. Seriously, there's this party I have oh, to go to. There'll be it plenty of time for parties when you're older, Maxie. Listen, about my directions. Will you listen to me? 
I gotta tell you something, Dad. Why bother? I'm probably too stupid to understand anyway, right? <sighs> Forget it. The car drives off in the midst of them addressing all of this. The way this is put together is crazy. They're both like so mad at each other, but they're literally helping each other too. You should have put the brake on! Why don't you just put it on yourself? See? You ruin everything. You should have let me stay at home! Why? So you didn't end up in prison? I'm not your little boy anymore, Dad! I've grown up! I've got my own life now! I know that! I just wanted to be part of it! Oh my god, it's so good, son! After they sing and piece it up, they approach a waterfall. Another part I feel like gets overlooked. Dad! Here's something that nobody talks about. The scared, goofy scream, my nigga. Like, not the cartoony one that the white boys do to impress girls at the kickback. The one with legitimate fear in his heart. <laughs> Fam, I have seen this movie more times than I've heard somebody say my name this year. And every time I see this part, I'd be so convinced that this nigga's gonna die. But they really... You couldn't put anything else here. We wouldn't take it seriously. Goofy's whole joke is that he gets kicked around, punched around, fucking explodes. He's never in any actual danger, right? So that scream, like, it had to be here to keep us just as invested and as scared as Max. Compared to the Hunchback where they just fucking... I'll say that the face Max makes when he thinks that he didn't catch Goofy and we briefly see him come to terms with the idea that he might have just watched his father die is such a morbid yet crucial detail. Max recites the perfect cast out loud while he does it, using all of the directions Goofy gave him. So when he saves him, that hug that they do isn't just like, oh you saved me, or oh you, you did the thing, it's you care about me, you've been paying attention this entire time. You listen. They pull up to the concert, we see Roxanne and everybody at the party waiting for Max. That good kid ain't there. I've been down so long, it look like up to me. The whole thing is just a masterclass in musicality and visual storytelling. It really is the perfect climax. Yeah, the final perfect cast callback, I've always loved that. The shot where Max lands on stage and looks at his dad in Powerline is probably my favorite shot in any Disney movie. Tevin Campbell's riff goes perfect with just this feeling of, holy shit, we made it. Like, this is really it. Goosebumps every time, my nigga, swear to God. I appreciate that this film ends with Max being honest with Roxanne. He kind of didn't have to. But from his experience with his dad, he sees how terrible things can get when you build a relationship based on lies. Roxanne, I lied to you. I don't even know Powerline. He kisses her like she kisses him in the beginning. He introduces his dad in contrast to how he was ashamed of him in the opening. And it pans up to the sky just like how it opens with a pan down from the sky. What the fuck? Holy shit. Why is this just so... I'm about to get violent, son. Really, a thing about the film that I think works that, admittedly, I hear a lot of people talk about is the relationship between Max and Roxanne. Like Man said, it's really sweet, genuine, and most importantly, it feels real. Of course, if you don't want to, I'd completely understand. Well, I was sort of kind of thinking that I'd love to. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Great. Terrific. Wonderful. All right. Okay. I'll, uh call you later okay look at him he's so fucking stupid how you gonna call her huh you don't even got her number dickhead that's how you know she like him because i could never get that off i'll uh 
call you later. You didn't even ask for my number, you fat bitch. Oh. You got kick? Nobody talks about this, but do you see the terror in this nigga's eyes when her fucking dad opens the door? It don't be like that, son. Yo, my man, my man, my man, open up. I'm trying to girk your fucking daughter. Respectfully, though. Respectfully, no disrespect. The kiss between these two in this film is brilliant. I don't think I've ever seen a better done first kiss. It's not a big moment. They don't grab each other and tongue each other down all crazy. It happens fast. It's awkward. They, like, laugh afterwards. <laughs> and he even does the goofy laugh, son. Just like, just like how he did in the opening. He does it in his nightmare. He does it when we first see them together. And he does it when they're together. If there's anything that this movie is good at, it's definitely bookends. Best kiss of my life. Best kiss of your life so far. Everywhere that I go, everywhere that I be If you were not surrounding me with your energy I've been racking my brain recently trying to figure out why exactly has our culture adapted this as like a black movie. Like, like really. Is it the soundtrack? I mean, maybe. But what? The two Tevin Campbell songs? The rest are just standard musical affair. By deduction, Hercules has a blacker soundtrack. Is it the character relationships? Again, maybe, but they're more evergreen, right? Like, this could be any race or ethnicity and they could identify just the same. Max isn't disrespectful enough to where you wonder why Goofy ain't smacked the shit out of him, so that kind of rules out the possibility of it being one of those situations where black people see a white kid in the store wilding and go, mm, 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 somebody need to whoop him. So, hear me out. I think a Goofy movie was adopted by the black community because until 2009, it was the first time Disney acknowledged that black people existed. That wasn't boring or racist or racist and boring. The way Max is dressed, the way they speak to each other, Tevin Campbell as Powerline in general. For a lot of us, this was the first time that we saw things animated like this on such a big scale and they did it with a character that we recognized. And because they didn't act like we couldn't exist underwater, or in France, or anywhere, it gave us a story that we feel comfortable identifying with and seeing ourselves in. And it's not even just black, it's like, alternative black? That shit is so cool. Some people might not understand this and think that it's kind of stupid. It's okay, I think you're stupid too. But, I don't know, I think it's a testament to how important representation is. Think about how many black people you see wearing Powerline shirts. I went to a fucking nightclub in college and they played eye to eye. The whole spot was jumping, are you serious? One shorty threw up on my homeboy's Raiders jersey, it was a whole vibe. And it's just, oh man, why is it, why is it just, why is it so good? In a way, we're kind of blessed that this movie even exists and is as good as it is. In all accounts, it shouldn't be. But it was done by a crew full of people that really cared about what they were making and gave it their all. Really think about it. The movie about two fucking dogs is more realistic to the human experience than like 95% of the other shit Disney was dropping back then. What you got? Like Pocahontas? You think we're blessed to have Pocahontas? Yeah, nigga, that shit, that shit blessed my bed, my motherfucking pillow, goddamn NyQuil I took before watching that bullshit. What's your big face sad as fuck Pocahontas, nigga? I like you. I don't even know Powerline. What are you talking about?
talking about? A billion people saw you dance with him. Yeah, well, I, I never met him before. Why would you make up something like that? I already liked you, Max. From the very first time I heard you laugh. Roxanne, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to meet my dad. On John <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Play the end card for real this song. Oh, hey, babe, come on, babe. I just want everybody to be Republican, babe. Come on. Mm -hmm. 